welcome to this edition of No Free Lunch, Economics for a Fallen World. I'm Professor Jeff Guernsey and I'm joined today by Dr. Jeff Heyman, the Dean of School of Business and the author of our book. So what we wanted to talk about today, Jeff, was the intersection of Christianity and economics. Mm -hmm. And some people think of the biblical narrative in the sense of creation, fall, restoration, and redemption. So my question to you is why is it important to think through a, with a Christian worldview in economics? Yeah, I think a biblical worldview really is essential for us to understand economics really from two ways. First of all, uh, as you start off that, that creation fall, uh, you know, redemption, uh, uh, restoration narrative, uh, is, is a way to think about God has a grand design that he's working through in, in all of history. Every, there, there's nothing accidental happening, and that includes our interactions that we do in, in the marketplace and everything else, that God is, is working those things out somehow in ways we don't understand to his, his glory, and they have purposes. Uh, and, and so uh, when we think about that grand historical narrative, we, we start to realize what's the most important thing that we, we need as, as humans. And we would argue that the most important thing we need as humans is to be reconciled to a holy God. We realize that there's a problem of sin, and, and we go through that, that, uh, that uh, creation fall uh, uh, narrative to take us to understand what our human condition is and what our real need is. And that will get into some things like uh, economically, like what kinds of institutions work best in a fallen world. And so understanding that uh, we, we have a fall that, that makes us who we are uh, now in this world, understand that God's working in us, uh, that, that's part of this as well. Uh, you know, and I would argue, and, and many people would argue, that perhaps the, the most important thing that we can do to bring glory to God is, is glorifying His Son by being conformed to His image. So uh, for the Christian, you know, Apostle Paul talks about his walking in a manner worthy, your, our walk, or in the, the, the theological terms, sanctification. How do we look more? How do we become more like Christ? And it seems to me that fundamentally freedom has something to do with God's purposes and plans. And we see that when we think about economics, freedom to choose, choose the right thing, or even the freedom to choose the wrong thing. Mm. That gives us the option. It's those moment-by-moment -moment choices we make. And, and the stewardship responsibilities we have in the garden, all of that kind of lend to the importance of, of this grand narrative God is taking us from where we are to what his ultimate place, uh, purposes are going to be for us. So that's, that's kind of first thing, uh, I would say. That's the grand narrative. Second thing, if I can go one step sure. further. Of course. You know, in economics, we talk about uh, things that we have positive and normative statements. Positive is mm. what is, normative is what should be. So we just kind of went through what should be mm. about and the normative view of economics uh, and, and, and how freedom weighs into that, our choices. We can become conformed to uh, the image of God's Son as we make wise choices with our stewardship. But also, very importantly, Positive economics wants to know what we're going to do, what is going to happen. Mm. And, and, if, and if economics is all about the study of human choice, human decision making, how we choose in economics, we typically are thinking in a market setting we make choices. Well, you really need to understand what it means to be human. And to understand mm. what it means to be human, you've got to have a Christian anthropology. That means you need to understand you were created in the image of God. I mean, that, that, that has so many things, and we should probably have another session mm. sometime to talk about we the could. implications of image <laughs> of God. But, but that has, has incredible inherent dignity in each of us. But yet, as we mentioned earlier, we're fallen. And so, fall, uh, but we want to make sure that our economic systems both understand that pre people created in the image of God have magnificent talents that they can use for the, the, to the benefit of the world, but yet we can exploit one another. We can do mm -hmm. harmful things to one another. How do we constrain the wickedness that others can do? Uh, and and we, we also were created finite. We see that in the garden. Uh, we were created in God's image, but yeah, we are dependent creatures. He is independent. We are dependent upon uh, God. And so that ought to give us a little bit of humility about what we can do uh, to, to run things and order things the way we would uh, have it. And kind of the final thing, the Christian uh, worldview that I say is really important, is God has created each one of us uh, very uniquely, 
uh, and, and the very diversity in all of his creation is precisely to bring him glory as we exercise our gifts in different ways. We see that uh, uh, in a lot of places in scripture in, in terms of spiritual gifts that we have. We see it in 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, Romans 12 has, has more. We see some of that in Ephesians uh, 4 and other places. Uh, and that kind of hints that we're all a little bit different. But when we exercise those gifts differently, the body of Christ benefits uh, uh, as, as, as we build each other up. Not everybody's a hand. Some people are a foot and so forth in the body. The same thing happens in a market setting. Uh, we have different gifts. Hmm. And when we exercise that gifts, I might like to teach. Uh, other people might want to repair cars. Other people might, might want to be doctors. And we do what God has wired us to be to do. We bless each other. And actually, in economics, one of the wonderful things, and we'll hit that in chapter two when we get to trade, is mm -hmm. we actually will get a higher level of social welfare by everybody doing what God has wired them to do. Uh, and so I think that's part of at least why we need to be thinking biblically as we think about economics. Great, thanks. And, and you tease out a lot more of that in chapter one of your text. So let me just, let's finish with this. Just briefly, you talked a, a bit about, um, has some implications for institutions, but how else practically does this Christian worldview get worked out in this discipline of economics, which talks about scarcity? Yeah, I mean, the practical implication of this is we, we one thing, just really practical, we have a lot of debates in, in how we should organize economically because there's, there's a utopian view that we can make the world uh, heaven on earth. Uh, many, many of our more socialist schemes will, will say that we need to be able to, to just have scarcity go away. Well, a Christian realized we are going to have utopia. That's going to be when Jesus comes again. But also hmm. means the Christian worldview is we can't be content with the world as it is, and we need to be about being the agents of change to make the world a better place. The, the task that we have in the garden, we saw every day of creation, God took disorder or chaos and made it more orderly. And our charge by God uh, to, 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 to rule over all of, of, of creation uh, as his stewards is to increasingly make order out of chaos. And every time a, a manager gets up in the morning and goes to work and says, how can I make our processes a little bit better? How can I serve the customer better? They're taking chaos and making mm. it more orderly. They are imaging their father and bringing glory to God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. So. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for joining us for this episode of No Free Lunch.